We're trying again. Elizabeth Alfano, Plant-Based Business Hour. I am here with Connie Spence, the founder of the Vegan Justice League. I am counting on our audience to let us know if they can hear our audio. Okay, so quick summary of where we left off, and then I'll let Connie take it from here. So we're talking about subsidies, what they are, and the impact that they have. So subsidies is money that comes out of your paycheck. So it's your taxes, and a portion of your taxes are going to prop up businesses, in this case, meat and dairy, such that they don't have to compete in the marketplace because they're getting extra financial help. And that puts them at a distinct advantage over plant-based companies that are having to compete without extra help. So it's not a level playing field for one. It also means that consumers who are buying plant-based items, I hear that Tom Vincel says he's, he's back on, but Tom, can you hear us? Tom, let us know if you can hear us. Okay. So, um, it means the consumer, when they vote with their dollars, when they go to buy a plant-based item, then, their demand isn't fully being registered because yes, plant-based items are growing, but no, their, their vote for not having meat and dairy is not being registered. Those companies are continuing to produce even when demand is low. Those co companies are not feeling the financial pain because they're getting uh, subsidies and, and extra help when they should just be adjusting their business models. That's what any business competing in fair market terms in a capitalistic society, which last I checked was what we hoped we would be, uh, that's not happening. So you actually don't have a degree decrease in animal products on the market, despite a decrease in demand in Western Europe and America. And that's what we're talking about today. And I believe people say that they can hear us. So thanks, Lisa. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Marla. So I will let you take it away uh, from, from there. And we were talking about the unfair business practices, but we were also talking about the current dumping of dairy. And I do have to say, I have not seen that yet in the headlines. I'm going to go look at that right away. But tell us about that. Yeah. So right now, um, so this goes back to uh, manipulating prices. And mm -hmm. so when you are unable to fail and you're getting reimbursed by our taxes for the, for the milk or meat that you don't sell, what do you do with it? Well, one of the things that you might do with it is put it in a stockpile. And there's a giant stockpile that um, exist with almost 4.5 billion pounds of both meat and dairy. But right now, right now, because of COVID-19 and the disruption of um, sales to the dairy industry, they received money in the stimulus package um, included in a, a package for livestock and dairy and the amounts of about 30 billion and even some say as high as $50 billion. With that said, even after that, um, the dairy farmers uh, have conglomerate associations and they've been telling their dairy cooperative farmers to dump the milk because they have too much supply. To keep it's prices said, high. To keep prices high. But mm -hmm. the thing is, is that they're doing it because they know they get reimbursed and you can find mm -hmm. quotes of them saying, you know, they're telling us to dump it all because, but we'll get reimbursed in a week. And that's our taxes reimbursing them. And the issue that I have with that is, is that the sympathy that farmers get because mm -hmm. they feed America or they feed people is why our taxes constantly go to help them. But the reality is if they're dumping milk out that consumers could that, you know, that still drink milk, um, especially right now, if they're dumping it out, they're essentially withholding food from people that need it. And not only that, but if they're doing it to manipulate prices, to keep prices high, they're continually trying to profit and capitalize off of you know, the current situation. And that's not right. So you can look up dumping of the milk. Um, it's anywhere per farm. You'll see Wisconsin, you'll see uh, Oregon, you'll see many states doing it. It, they're claiming anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000 gallons of milk are being dumped per day. And by the end of it, it's going to be multi-millions of milk just dumped, all that our taxes are reimbursing. So the question I leave us with is how do we save a dairy cow if the food system is rigged to where even if we're buying plant-based options, 
our taxes are actually blocking us from saving those cows and then reimbursing them when they don't um, have the demand and when nobody is buying their product. Yes. So, so it should be angering to people on many levels because their tax dollars are going to something that they don't agree with. Their tax dollars are used to, to uh, encourage a system that is very anti-American because we believe in level playing fields with business and we believe in the consumer really having a voice regardless of the type of product. You know, even if you're talking about children's toys or whatever, it doesn't have to be meat and dairy. We're just talking about the general business practices of America. This is not how America runs a capitalist seemingly capitalist business system. Uh, and then your taxes are being taken out and and truly wasted here wasted. in the sense that if you're, you know, throwing out products and you're continuing to uh, um, produce products where demand is lower, but you're producing products anyways. And then of course the environmental waste and the harm to animals. And we can also say the harm to our own health and our healthcare system as our healthcare system is taxed because so many people are unhealthy. I'll throw in a statistic according to Dr. Kim Williams, who's the cardiologist and head of the uh, Rush Medical Center cardiology department says that 97% of Americans are heart unhealthy. This comes from eating animal products, animal proteins, and you know, that's taxing up obviously our healthcare system. So it, it's a waste of resources in so many ways. It's a waste of our dollars. It's a waste of land and water. It's a waste of our healthcare system. And it's not reflective of consumer demand and how our business system is supposed to work. So um, before I get to what we consumers can do about this, and I really want to get to that because I do believe that this show is here to inspire and motivate, and I want people to remember that their dollars do count, and we are here to ensure that your voice is always heard. So we're going to get to very soon what you can do about it. But I just want to say for clarification, and let's have this conversation, Connie, I speak for myself and the Jane Unchained Network by no means are we anti-American farmer. I'm actually voicing this subject because I'm pro-American farmer. The average small American farmer is, is saddled with debt. And this is a bad economic equation, as you can see, that they're having to live on subsidy check to subsidy check to keep going. This is not a future for them. Actually, plant-based innovation creating not only a safer food supply, but also jobs. This is why if we can help the American farmer switch over to a more productive and more substantial living for themselves, this would be a much better equation. I'm not saying it's easy and you can't snap your fingers. And I understand that there's a, a lot of the system that would need to change and that takes time. But I just want to be clear to people this is in support of the small American farmer. Uh, the, the entities that love the big subsidies are the corporate farms, which are huge. And, you know, it, America is not red barns anymore, people. So it's not cartoon animals uh, wagging their tails and, you know, playing with their tongues. I mean, I think we're all adults and we know that most farms are factory farms and they're owned by corporations. And uh, it's in solidarity with the small American farmer that we're looking to get them a better uh, a better life and a better livelihood. If you would like to comment on that, Connie, please let me know. Yeah, a few things. So one, this 80% of subsidies and these bailouts actually go to mega farmers. Small farmers are pushed out on purpose and they're pushed out because of that point um, you're making is that smaller farmers are actually wanting to make sure that people are fed. Um, larger farmers are just wanting profit and money. Um, and so with that said, um, we Agriculture Fairness Alliance actually represents in a lot of regards the ideals of a small farmer. So our first legislation is an at-risk farmer and rancher transition act. And what we're trying to do is instead of dumping our tax dollars to bailouts and subsidies and then and then them dumping the milk out and then perhaps them failing and that the well. mega farmer co-op right stays intact because they're getting all of the tax dollars and bailouts um, we would prefer to divert and use tax money to transition that small farmer into something sustainable regenerative plant-based or plant-based adjacent so our legislation our first legislation we launched it in october um, we were great, getting a lot of great momentum after a year of of creating um, the education piece and trying to get people on board to understand that 
vegan consumerism is great, activism is great, and veganizing people is great, and it really adjusts the social aspect of the movement, but the law, the mm. law aspect that we, we are challenged with, the laws that take our taxes out and send them over to this industry, the laws that um, are making the, this industry fail-proof, the way that we have to combat that is the same way that they they got those uh bailouts in the first place which is lobbying mm -hmm. and so their lobbyists are constantly in the ear in dc and statewide um pressuring politicians to give them more without vegan lobbyists basically going up against them at a grand scale so we hired our first lobbyist in October, our legislation launched in. We are not anti-farmer. What we are is um, anti-conglomerate, monopoly, factory farms, um, abusive practices to um, undocumented workers. That's what we're against. What we want to bring back is fairness in agriculture um, and not dumping our taxes out in the drain with milk. Yeah, so incredibly wasteful. But but you make a great point. It really is a two-part system. So it's the subsidies, but the subsidies are defended by lobbyists. So lobbyists are um, paid people to go to Washington and really make sure that what is in place for their clients stays in place. And that's the Farm Bill, which um, you had said gets revised or uh, gets reviewed every four to five years. So um, therein lies perhaps a window for us to do something about it. Perhaps you can explain how the consumer, we've talked about using your dollars, we've talked about using your voice, but now you got to get that voice to Washington and also support, of course, the Vegan Justice League, because what you're doing is um, employing lobbyists of your own, fighting fire with fire. Is that right? Correct. So that first piece of legislation, we had to do something in the meantime, because the the farm bill was signed in 2019. And so between now and four or five years, we're not just going to sit back. We're going to create these relationships with the legislation at hand. We are planning on, um, we're sending members of our, our members a poll to see what type of legislation to push next. Um, you know, some there's a bunch of other things that we can do in the meantime before the next farm bill. But what we want to do is we want to prove out that economically that the wastefulness of our subsidies propping up the industry to be more competitive and then the, the not selling and not having the demand and then asking for bailouts and dumping it out Insane. is just wasteful for all of us. It doesn't yes. matter if you're vegan or not. Yeah. Meat eaters, meat eaters and dairy drinkers do not want to see animals dying and suffering in vain and water being used and land being used for nothing. I mean, the reality is, is we are actually all on the same page about this where, um, you know, we want to make sure that, that when we go to Congress, that, that it is very bipartisan, um, that we speak in a way that, um, you know, that both Republicans and Democrats can be on board with. And that speaks to all of us, vegans, animals, non-vegans, people that live near factory farms and, and everybody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I want to jump in here because I think that's so accurate. First, I'm going to ask you to move to the right a little bit. There you go. Just get out of there. Move from that logo. Uh, yes. Okay. That's great. So uh, yes, I want to say I had Josh Bulk, who is the vice president at uh, the Humane Society of the United States. And he was saying the exact same thing that it's actually here on this subject, uh, the taking care of animals where Republicans and Democrats agree. It's perhaps the only thing we do agree on is that no one, unless they're psychologically ill, but that's the very minority that you might come across in some odd YouTube video. The majority of people, 99.99%, both Democrat, independent, or Republican, don't want to see animals harmed and don't believe in animal cruelty. So we all agree on that. And no one wants their dollars wasted. Doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. No one wants to see the dumping of products, the wasting of land, the wasting of water, the wasting of money, the waste waste of our taxes. No one wants to see their money thrown away, particularly in face of drowning demand. So uh, this is actually, I think, a very bi bipartisan issue. And I think it's an area where we can all agree and all want to see change. So are you seeing that in Washington? Yeah, I mean, so we do talk to Republican legislators, our lobbyist does. I'm not. See, the thing is, is I want to be very clear. Um, 
I'm not a lobbyist. I was a vegan activist who wanted to do everything I could to speed up animal liberation. Starting the Vegan Justice League and Agriculture Fairness Alliance happened because I didn't see a strong, powerful, vegan-backed lobbying group at the federal level that was trying to reduce the stockpile and trying to act to to uh, work a way to to animal liberation. And so with that said, I founded the group, but I founded it knowing that I wasn't going to be the lobbyist. I mm -hmm. just wanted to quarterback. I knew how to quarterback everything through. So mm -hmm. we hired a career lobbyist to be in DC and to create these relationships. And so far, um, it's very likely that the legislation up until this point, you know, was showing signs of getting sponsored. Um, there are new challenges that we face right now, and that sure. is that you can't physically create these relationships and set up meetings in the same way that that um, you did before. Um, so we may have to address with a future piece of legislation. Um, uh, and we actually have other legislation ideas in mind. There's um, insurance policies that our taxes pay for that actually prevent them also from being fail proof. So there's margin protection, which means uh -huh. that um, that essentially it, if they don't make the amount they thought they were going to make, it's like gap insurance and we pay for the difference. And so, um, there's just a bunch of other ways that these things exist in the farm bill that in the meantime, we can create specific legislation. The bipartisan angle is really important. And that's because right now in a lot of ways, vegans are seen as a liberal fringe movement. Um, and you know, we need, while that may be true in some circles, we need to get fiscal conservatives on our side. And I think that this is the exact way to show how wasteful it is to basically um, uh, prop up an industry that is withholding food instead of actually giving it and creating more accessibility to the public right now. So I want to hop in there. I, I, it's funny because I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who's Republican and in office on the East Coast or running for office. And I said to him, I sent him an email just this morning. I said, you know, job growth and American innovation and uh, protecting the American capitalist system where consumers have the truest and strongest voice are things we can agree on. So, you know, he just assumed that this was a left wing fringe uh, topic, but I've been talking to him about the economics behind it, the job creation behind it, the uh, veg tech that is going on right now on the West Coast that is ensuring that American innovation will continue to be the leading innovation in the world as we go from 7 billion people to 10 billion people, but we're not getting more land and we're not getting more water. So you're going to have to shift the business model of how you feed those people. There just isn't enough land and water to keep going, not to mention that uh, there's so, so many issues with it from a health standpoint, meatborne pandemics and uh, poisoning water and, uh, you know, ground swells, et cetera. So uh, there's all these good economic and American reasons to, start shifting your food supply. And I do believe that we are living in a time of dramatic change. And by the time, Connie, For you sure. and I in our lifetime, I do believe that our, our grandchildren, our kids' grandchildren will look back and say like, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe that's sure. actually how they ran their life. Um, I do want to say one more thing before I ask you another question. So just in case you're worried about your dollars getting through, while your lack of demand for meat and dairy isn't getting through as it should. And this is why Connie is there at the Vegan Justice League. Your preference and demand for plant-based is getting through. And I do believe it's a dual-edged fight. So Connie, and hopefully you can support her, is fighting it in Washington, D.C. with lobbies, uh, vegan lobbyists against meat and dairy subsidies. But when meat and dairy sees plant-based items being profitable, growing, more consumer demand, they're going to switch. I do believe this. This is why you're already seeing meat company, Maple Leaf in Canada used to be a meat company, now calls itself a protein company. Cargill used to be a meat company, now calls itself a protein company. Dannon has bought Silk and So Delicious. So these meat and dairy companies are shifting because they can see the consumer demand is shifting. So voice your dollars on plant-based products. Connie, what else can we do besides continuing to buy plant-based products and supporting you? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that's actually what we need to think about is it's one thing when we're talking to a non-vegan audience and, you know, at a certain point you can't unload all of this information on them that, okay, that, you know, you have subsidies that are that are competing with your consumer dollar. But when we're talking to vegans, it's important that we start thinking about ways that are more sophisticated that can work in parallel to to speed up the ship that we're steering towards mm -hmm. animal liberation. Mm -hmm. And so it's imperative, in my opinion, that we become lobbying members either to a local group or to national groups all across the world so that our voices are channeled and heard. Politicians don't create laws when they simply see people on the street with a sign that maybe isn't readable from their office. They create, they need you to create a relationship, shake their hand, walk in and say, hey, me and my gang of you know, 50 other people outside are, are plant-based and we're tired of our taxes being wasted. Or by the way, I actually represent these small farmers too, and they're tired of being pushed out of um, you know, getting subsidy help and seeing these mega farmers dump out their milk. The reality is, is right now, we didn't have a channel of communication to legislators that was telling them what our demands were, right? Doing disruptions and, and saying, and dairy is great for the social conversation. And perhaps that legislator might be like, you know what, maybe I'll think about this concept, but you're not telling them what your, your demands are. You have to create a channel of communication to do that. So what can we do? It, every social justice movement in our history mm -hmm. was up against laws, whether mm -hmm. it was women's right to vote, whether it was uh, ending civil slavery, rights, yep. whether it was civil rights and desegregating schools, every single one of them had to dismantle laws that were preventing them from their own liberation. And every one of them had very strong lobbying groups. In fact, most of the time, they'd be at lobbying conventions together and then they'd start marching together. Mm -hmm. We let lobbying be such an oversight and a lot of us are really scared about politics. And that's kind of why I was saying, be the quarterback. You can still march the streets and do activism and you know format new ways to get the word out and veganize people. At the same time, the lobbyist is creating relationships. And so one doesn't defeat the other, one doesn't compete with the other, but we can't keep running off of a system where only like a thousand of us are lobbying members across the United States and thinking that that is actually, you know, going to change laws at scale. We have to grow, we have to scale. We need to be behind President Trump or whatever president is 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 voted in and behind them shaking hands just like the the big agriculture farm bureau is they are in many pictures with him week after week yes. um shaking hands and and telling them what they need mm -hmm. um so. I, I i agree with you you have to work with the system that you've got at at hand and you have to reach on both sides of the aisle and you have to know your facts so you really do have to understand the numbers, understand how this all works, understand how the system works, understand how politics works. Um, it is we it's it's a sister program of politics and business together. So business thrives best when legal the legal system is supportive of it. Subsidies really aren't I understand why they were created in the 30s obviously great coming off the great depression etc it was a different time they don't serve us now be mm -hmm. be us republicans or democrats they don't they're a poor use of resources they're a poor use of taxes um they really only go to support a few and so in support of the small american farmer and of course our own human health and the future of a safer food supply and animals and the longevity of the planet. It's in our own best interest, all of us to come together and really lobby Washington. So that we can do that by 
one helping you, the Vegan Justice League, also by reaching out on the other side of the aisle of our own friends and family, the people that might think this is a left-wing fringe movement. It is not. It's really about their taxes. And, and Connie or I can help you with that conversation if you want to practice with us and craft it. But I also do want to say there are other organizations. Lisa Carlin, shout out to her. She mentioned this, but I was also, she mentioned the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine has been trying to work on uh reducing or eliminating subsidies that go to support meat and dairy from the health perspective. Also the plant-based food association, I believe is doing something similar. And I'm wondering if you work with either of these groups. So the plant-based food association is primarily, I mean, when we look at what legislation they're pushing or legislation they're, they're defending right now, state by state, um, what, the industry is going through is a labeling battle of yes. whether you can call plant-based milks, milk, um, sausage. Yeah. And so from what I understand, the plant-based association is, is all over the place with doing that in a great way where they're defending those changes and things like that. Um, federally. And so the physicians committee, I think, uh, focus on the health angle. Um, and so a lot of it is based on school systems and accessibility of plant-based options and things like that. And they do a great job. Um, but as far as like directly attacking and challenging how our taxes are used to reduce that stockpile, um, we are the first that mm -hmm. is federally um, doing that. And so that doesn't mean any one of us is better than the other. We just have different um, focus points. And so um, we, Agriculture Fairness Alliance wants to be an alliance so that we all are um, helping each other. And mm -hmm. so um, conversations with these other groups have happened. There's a, a great group in California that they do a great job of pushing um, legislation in California and, and we're in an alliance with them. And so um, the best thing that I would say is any one of these lobbying groups that you believe in absolutely become a member because your money helps drive um, more lobbyists to then be uh, an ear and mouthpiece for a different narrative that's more accurate to politicians. Because right now an, an inaccurate narrative is being given to them and you can see it in what's going on today with all that milk being dumped mm -hmm. out, letters from their co-op have gone to the agriculture secretary of the United States and is asking them for more money. So yeah. in that letter, they'll it probably say, get it. Right. But in that letter, it doesn't say we're dumping milk out and withholding mm -hmm. it from people. They mm -hmm. just say that we're suffering and need more money. So we need to be in there and telling politicians, Hey, listen, it, I don't want, nobody wants our taxes. If they're, if there's videos of them and even quoted saying dump out milk, like let's, let's, let's create a channel of communication to block that inaccurate narrative. Um, let me tell you or ask you, Connie, if you have any specific mag uh, newspaper articles, please send them to me. And the link to one or two of those will be in the notes for this show. So, um, and, and I do understand what, what people are saying in the comments here and that, uh, it, this is a monumental task to try to change what has been in existence for a hundred years, which seemingly through inaccurate narratives seems to be tied to the American way of life. Many people still think that all barns are red and that 50% uh, of the United States is small farmers. And, uh, you know, that hasn't been the case since the late sixties or seventies. I, um, I don't want to throw out figures. My understanding is it's in the single digits for actual small farmers. I could have that wrong, but it is not what culturally we are led to believe. So um, I think many people just believe that it's the American way of life to subsidize at meat and dairy. And so this is going to be very hard to change. And I understand why some of the comments are saying, well, maybe everyone should unite because it's not an easy task. You have a very big task ahead of you, Connie. Yeah. And politics is hard for us to understand. And that's what I was saying. Don't shy away from it simply from your lack of understanding. I was in the same boat and it's really, that's, that is why corporations, um, in so many ways, when you see stimulus package, they're getting bailouts that are much bigger than the ones that the public gets because they are, they do lobby. And so 
what you know i think one of the questions you you asked me is like what is a theme or something that i live by and it's like to not get paralyzed by perfection mm. um we're not perfect politicians we're not perfect in our knowledge of all of these systems but that's why you quarter back it through and centralize um you know with professional lobbyists that are and that understand that landscape and how to how to get it through Mm -hmm. um, I, lo I love that. Don't let perfection be the enemy of good. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, sum up for us, because I we're talking about politics and taxes and lobbies and subsidies. I do have a couple exit questions for you, but sum up for us, if you were to say the top three things that people should be doing to uh, end subsidies so that plant-based foods can actually compete in the marketplace on an even, even playing field and have a, a good chance of growing, what should people do? Well, first of all, you know, it depends on the audience if you're non-vegan or vegan, but if you're already vegan and you're already um, consuming vegan products, like no one's going to say over consume more. Like at the end of the day, you know, use your knowledge um, to educate other people. But this is a bridge to, so, so theme one would be um, this the economic side of this is a bridge to every conversation for conservative um, people across the United States as well. So yeah. instead of you might um, get blank stares when you talk about climate, you might get um, a backlash when you when you try to talk about the emotional angle of animals. Use the economic side of how hurtful this is to our economy and how it's actually withholding food from people that need it. Um, and, and and discuss how wasteful it is. And so that's the first thing is bridge that gap. The second is if you have the ability to, um, if your socioeconomic condition allows you to have the ability to be a member of a lobbying group. Um, I know I saw some comments there saying that I may not know what other lobbying groups do. And I do, I, I read their legislation specifically um, we absolutely need to join power and whether you join one of their groups or ours, we have to scale lobbyists at a, at a faster rate than we are. Again, mm -hmm. it can't just be people that are politically inclined. Every one of us, if we have a socioeconomic condition, it is imperative for us to do this because we can't be in 10 years from now looking back and saying, hmm, I wonder why they're still dumping milk out and still producing more and more cows and, to do it. And by the way, that's nothing new. Milk dumping, this is not the first time you can look historically. Right. Uh, this is not the first time something like milk dumping has has happened. And obviously then the, this, the situation for animals isn't changing, nor is it right. changing for people. If they're, if they're consumer choices that they want plant-based items, uh, that's not changing either if subsidies are in place. Um, I'm, right. Did the you have- third, Yeah, the, thir the third thing is educating people on this because so I don't wanna discount the ability of, of change that can be made from the social activism part but if you don't educate vegans who are already vegan on how to get this to the next level, we're doing mm -hmm. a disservice to each other. Yeah. So if we're constantly high-fiving each other because a dairy um, farm closes and we don't realize that not one more cow was saved because our taxes are popping it up, we're basically thinking that that's a barometer to congratulate ourselves for saving animals when really animal liberation and veganism are not attached in the same way as they used to be. So just because you're seeing a ton more vegan options and just because dairies are shutting down isn't a barometer of how many animals are saved. So we need to educate vegans to get mm. to the next level so that we know how to then chisel away at these laws so that our demand is heard and it reduces the amount of animals they produce. In short, use your dollars, use your voice. These are the two strongest things you have at your disposal. If yeah. you want to take to the streets with a sign, that's wonderful too. But your voice and your dollars, everything you do 
is activism. Get on Instagram, start educating through memes and talking to your friends at dinner and helping people understand some of the concepts that we're talking about here, where your tax dollars are going, how this is not an American business practice, and we all want our consumer choices to be heard. Uh, here's just a small example of even if you're afraid of politics or even the big economic question, uh, obviously we're in COVID-19, everyone can't go to restaurants. One of my very, very favorite restaurants in Chicago is a deep dish Chicago style vegan pizzeria oh, and to reinvent themselves they started uh doing a deep freeze of the pizzas so that they could ship up to 32 states in the united states so i've right. been sending my friends deep to chicago style pizza all over the country yeah. it's just a surprise and to be happy and to say like hey look how good deep to chicago style pizza is once once i start with food the conversation opens and people are willing to listen to me about the rest of it which is economics yeah. and politics and the environment and animal welfare and uh, our our tax dollars our healthcare system our wallet, et cetera. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Connie again to shift to the right and then a couple quick exit questions. Uh, so what are your predictions to the future? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, when it comes to what we're going through right now, I think that the shape of the food system is changing drastically. A lot of you guys may not go on the USDA website, but I would suggest that you do because then your your uh, magic ball of predictions probably will be a little bit better. Um, and what I mean by that is pig disease is a huge topic across the world right now. African and swine fever is raging in China. Allegedly African swine fle fever with no test. So it's very mm -hmm. interesting to have the largest zoonotic animal pandemic in the world going right now in parallel to a human yes. pandemic. Okay. And the geographical locations are very stunningly similar. So in on March 5th, Trump signed legislation to hire 1300 technicians and testers and canine units across land, air and sea of every border in the United States which equates to $43 million in 2020 and uh, higher amounts every year to 2022 to prevent pig disease. Do you, so, so my prediction is this, pandemics is on all of these politicians across the world's radars sure. and the food system is absolutely adjusting to it, whether you hear it on the news or not. Um, my prediction is is that uh, the food system is going to go through a very rigorous amount of change that is either going to expose these diseases that exist in these animals or it's going to cover it up. And so we need to constantly be searching for, um, you can go on science journal sites and beyond to start searching for the connections and what the world scientists are saying, which might not map to what media is saying and which might not map to what our governments are saying. So go ahead. It has been shocking to me how the African swine fever, you're saying allegedly, I, I, I actually thought that was a technical name for it. And I could have that wrong. African no, swine. No, it's the right name. It, it, but but the symptoms are identical, upper respiratory symptoms right. are identical. And so to different coronaviruses in right. pigs, and they don't, in China and Eastern Asia, they didn't test all these pigs. They just assumed that it was African swine fever. It could have easily been a re upper respiratory coronavirus that pigs do in fact get. And they also get a gastrointestinal mm -hmm. coronavirus as well. And so that's what I'm saying when you look at Trump, who signed in on March 5th while, the hu while humans are going through a pandemic, mm -hmm. he signed in legislation to create $43 million of infrastructure mm -hmm. to test pigs at every border. It's very telling about you know, what the situation that we're in with biosecurity and with 
and with the food system. My hope uh, here is that it becomes apparent that it's not sustainable. I mean, just the fact of, of what you're talking about, $43 million, but also if you look up and you can just Google this, um, I understand that it's a third of the pigs in China have been decimated because of this spreading disease. And now you're saying there are concerns that it's coming to the United States. I actually heard... like. I, I'm just saying what I read. I'm not saying this is fact. You, you know, these you never know what journalists are actually reporting. But I did read in some case that it actually started here in the United States before being exported to China first. We export a lot of food to them. So it just seems, regardless of the country, started, that this isn't sustainable as you it's, look to have a safer food supply system to feed people. It's, it's not. And, you know, and again, going back to it, sustainable or safe, Right now, because China lost so many pigs to this, they lost, to your point, one third. I've seen actually over the last year, it's up to 50%, which amounts to 300 um, million pigs or more that were killed before being killed because yes. of the virus. Wasted, they're, fly really. they're flying in on airplanes, pigs from France, live yeah. pigs yeah. on airplanes while there is a pandemic. and. Yeah what putting 6,000 pigs on planes from France to China somehow is allowed right now while humans are in lockdown and can't fly and travel across mm -hmm. borders. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the reason it's like time for us to open up questions, we should be pressuring our legislators to prove that that pig meat and meat coming in across borders has been tested to not be carrying COVID-19 or any other virus. We need them to prove that to us. That's really why I'm doing this show, because uh, if you want a safer food supply, it has to be plant-based foods. This is just absolutely. not a safe food supply. It, no, I it's mean, not. We're seeing it again and again and again. And nature is outsmarting us, outsmarting us, as we've also seen historically. So we think we're getting ahead of COVID-19. Well, there's another Asian bird flu, which is a COVID kind of disease. I mean, there's just more following Ebola, med cow disease. When are we going to get the memo? So uh, your voice has to be heard, folks. You have to get out there and uh, vote with your dollars. And, you know, don't be afraid of politics and economics. Get in there with your representatives and let them know. And don't wait for your government to give you a safe future and mainstream media isn't covering this at all. So it's pretty clear that they have a vested interest in some other kind of story because the real story for consumers health is not getting out there. So uh, in one sentence though, Connie, what's your prediction for the future? One sentence. My prediction is that we obviously are going to have a vegan future, but we have a lot of hustling to do. And so let yeah. everybody get on board, get together. Um, let's not trip each other up. Let's amplify um, and my last sentence is um, vegan women in this movement need your support, not your scrutiny. Um, and what kind uh, of scrutiny are you talking about? Oh, when I release data, I could literally be putting Excel spreadsheets uh, straight from the USDA. And I have um, a lot of scrutiny uh, that happened to other people that, mm -hmm. um, I, I just think there's a, a bit of, I think there's a bit of sexism in our movement. Noted. Uh, okay. That's a, that's a whole other show, Connie. Yeah, so, it is, but we'll I, that's to, why I support go. women. I support women, um, you know, uh, joining that your show and, and amplifying other women. Um, it's really important to me. Um, you know, that we uh, amplify each other's voices. Uh, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Oh, the political deep state of yeah. all of this. I, yeah. I mean, I, I wish I would have started this ten years ago. I mean, yeah. to to that point, I feel like I, um, the amount of activism I was doing every single night and veganizing people in the street, I love doing that, and I would love to be able to focus on that. Um, and but now I have to shift. I just. 10 years ago, I had no idea that our government was basically acting as the business development and sales guy of meat and dairy. Um, and so I wish I knew that. Uh, I would, I would agree with that. Once you start opening the vegan book and you realize, oh gosh, it's more than just switch out your meat and dairy choice. It's 
how it's supported, how it's marketed to you. My heart always goes out to men. They've been sold this horrible marketing campaign that you can't be a real man unless you have erectile dysfunction yeah. and heart disease. I mean, they get they get a bad brunt of it. But um, okay, my second to last question for you. When was the moment you knew that you would go vegan? Is there one moment in time when you thought, I can never go back? Yeah, so my journey actually started with like seeing the impacts of certain health issues I had beforehand. Hmm. And so um, I had only I had given up meat, just challenging myself. And um, I had a really bad detox. I, I know some people now don't but back then there weren't vegan meat options. And so you literally were eating lettuce all the time. And I probably wasn't getting the right nutrients, hmm. you know, 10 or well, actually giving up meats been 13 years ago. Um, and so I had a bad detox. I got headaches and stuff and things that mm. again, now you would never, it would never be as challenging because there's so many mm. great vegan options. Um, anyways, I gave it up for three weeks and you know, when you go to a place that serves a lot of food, it was a taqueria. I got a, a vegan burrito and they cooked it on the meat grease. And at that time I was like, well, okay, like, you know, I, I didn't say clean up the meat grease. I got so Most sick. sick. For three so sick for three days. And it was so bad that and it instantly within five minutes of eating, I was like, Oh, my gosh, I feel like I've been poisoned. Mm -hmm. uh, that moment was like, I, my body, this isn't right. If I gave mm -hmm. up fruit, if I gave it fruit for three weeks and ate fruit, I wouldn't feel poisoned, like something's right. not right. So that was instant. The second affirmative piece to all of it was going and to slaughterhouse and witnessing animals. That oh, emotional man. connection will change you for the rest of your life, for the rest of your life. You will feel so duped and lied to that all of those milk cartons were such horrible, horrible lies. I really, I've seen the videos. I can't bring myself to do it in person. Uh, I have a similar story to yours. I went vegan and then I sort of thought as a treat three months later after I'd been 100% vegan, I had cheese pizza, not meat, just cheese pizza. I thought I was going to die. I was That's so hard. sick for the whole weekend. And I thought, I can't believe people do this to them. I can't believe I used to do this to myself. Uh, so yeah, I never went back. Okay, last word, because we've, we've been together for a while. Thank you for all that yeah. you do. And thank you for your comments and for your educating us today. That was your point number three of what we need to yeah. do. And you've been educating us today. So I appreciate that. What is your favorite junk food? You're busy, you're running around, you're lobbying Washington. Well, you're not the lobbyist, but you're quarterbacking for the lobbyists who lobby Washington. And you don't have time for lunch. What's your go-to junk food? So it's not junk if you eat a little bit. It's junk when you eat it like I do. It's called bitchin' sauce, and it's basically like a oh, pine yeah. nut type of hummus. It's <laughs> not hummus, but I I buy a tub of it, and I think I'm going to dip a piece of broccoli in it. It turns into dipping 20 pieces of broccoli, a bunch of chips, a bunch of crackers, and I'll eat one tub in one day. And it'll turn into a meal when it should have just been a snack. And I, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's junk food when you can't stop eating it. Oh my God. So you are singing my song. I would yeah. like to say thank you for all that you do. Connie Spence, founder of thank Vegan you. Justice League and the Agricultural Farmers Alliance. Consider Connie, perhaps in this day of COVID when we're all stuck at home, giving a seminar on this subject, because one of the things you talked about was educating other vegans. You have a wealth of knowledge here. Maybe it's a two or three day class or, you know, for three weeks in a row on a Wednesday or something, but you have a lot of information to impart to people. These are tricky subjects. It's not there. something that people grew up with maybe or studied in school. And so I think just having the information is the strongest tool we can have in our toolbox. So I'll just leave There's you with that launch, thought. Uh, climate, climate summit, CDS summit, dot com where i i am part of and that is gets released next week and it's an hour of subsidy conversations mm -hmm. and then um i am speaking with a, a group of activists in belgium so people reach out to me on vegan underscore batgirl on instagram and reach out to me to do podcast education i'm open to doing it um you know all the time um and then my co-founder also does some of these so Absolutely. Um, you know, if, if there is uh, the appetite for it and the education piece, I will, you know, consider to host some of these.
I'll say it's one of the silver linings of COVID-19 is that I'm also getting a lot of invitations to speak at plant-based business summits and online classes and online courses. And uh, I'm doing a course with West Los Angeles College next Saturday. So there's a lot of opportunity, not just for you and me, but also anybody who's listening, all these comments I see uh, on the chain here, uh, get out and educate and speak and use your voice and use your dollars. I'll sign off by saying Laura Russell, Marla Katz, Michelle Alfano, Tom Vincell, Lori Ness. Uh, I've seen so many of you here. I don't want to miss anybody. Everybody, Tara Alfano, you guys, thanks for being here. Uh, Patty, Pity, Ramos, I love it that you're here. Marla Katz, I super appreciate it. So all the, and I'm and I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but everybody, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate it. Vegan Justice League, Connie Spence, I love what you do. Thanks for everything. Thank you so much. And uh, remember, together we are taking back our health and the health of the planet. I will see you tomorrow. It'll be Jane Unchained live from India. The Plant-Based Business Hour tomorrow. I'm Elizabeth Alfano at 1 p.m. Pacific. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, everyone.